I'm John Rigetti. They've become popular symbols of faith today, and in fact, some people even collect replicas of them. We're talking about angels. What are they really? Quaylen Nassar is going to be talking with Father John Nosel, pastor of Archangel Michael Orthodox Church in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Father has actually taught courses about angels at Westmoreland County Community College, so he's somewhat of an expert. So if you're interested in angels, or you're a strong believer in them, stay with us. I'm Quaylen Nassar, angels, angels, that's what we're talking about. Father John Nosel, thank you so much for being with us. You know, it's so popular. What are angels, though? Quaylen, before we get started, um, it's, it's always, oh, I've, I think a very orthodox thing to do to try and put this in perspective. So I'm going to take a moment to do that. I'm going to do it with um, a, an apology, a prayer. prayer and also a, a couple of quotations. But here's the apology. The apology goes to my guardian angel, your guardian angel, and to <laughs> any other angels who are in the room with us right now. Um, because it's kind of rude of me and us to be talking about them as though they're not here, when they are here. Um, it's also important for us to remember uh, that what we're going to be talking about tonight is not dogmatic. So you don't need to believe anything too particular about the angels in order to be an Orthodox Christian. Okay? okay? So there are certain things we have to believe. This is not one of those kinds of things. Okay. Um, and I'm going to start with a warning. This comes from um, Bishop Ignatius Branchaninov from the uh, middle of the 19th century, who says, A general rule for all men is by no means to trust the spirits when they appear in sensuous form, not to enter into conversation with them, not to pay any attention to them, to acknowledge their appearance as a great and most dangerous temptation. And uh, so in, in uh, short form, that would be, um, if an angel of light comes to your room, tell him he's got the wrong room. Why? And that's the general attitude of our church, because we have to be careful, because we don't know who's coming. So um, in this day and age when the angels are so popular, mm -hmm. and that's interesting too. Um, I have a book here uh, by Mother Alexandra of a Holy Transfiguration Monastery in Elwood City, The Holy Angels, um, where she laments back in 1981 that you can't find books or information on the angels. Go to a bookstore now yes. um, and see what happens. The shelves are full. Why? Well, partly because we need them. Partly because the, the world, even if we remember back those, those 25 years, is a more dangerous place. And, and so people are thinking about them. People are paying attention to them. Um, now maybe I can get on to your question, which is, what are they? A simple definition um, of what an angel is comes you from have a real definition. I have here. a real yes. definition coming from the New Catholic Encyclopedia. And it's it's nice and short and to the point. Celestial spirits who serve God in various capacities. So spirits serving God, various capacities. What are those capacities though? I mean when you when you really look at I mean we know that there are different levels, but what do those capacities mean? Okay, and once again, in, in very good Orthodox fashion, um, one of our sayings that we hear is, if you want to know what a people believe, see what they pray. So I brought a prayer with me today. Okay. It comes from the uh, Monday services, which is the day that's dedicated to the Holy Angels, which says something about how important they are in our tradition, that they get a whole day of, of commemoration every week. And so the prayer goes like this. And what you need to do, as I'm saying them, is listen to the key words, which I'll try to emphasize. Okay, so we really have to pay attention. We to really this. have to pay attention. Okay, so we'll and you really get it listen. all in a nutshell. Everything okay. else will be commentary. Great. O oh, heavenly servers of God, guardians of men and foes of the devils, I bow before you, blessed spirits, and rejoice in your greatness. You stand never slumbering. With faith you watch, and with haste serve the will of our God. Untiringly, you strive and ever conquer, having no other care but to chase away the enemies of God and of His creation. O blessed guardian of men, I venerate you and thank you for the help which every day you give us for your guidance and for praying to God for us. Above all, I bless you for your care of me, an unworthy sinner. O holy angel, guardian of my soul, and thou, Michael the archangel, my help, do not be offended at me. Do not leave me alone, 
but guard me day and night until I shall with true repentance give my soul into the hands of God my Maker. Save me from all the enemies, seen and unseen, that I may not from now on repeat my faults before God, so that upon my death, I may be worthy of seeing you, that you will be standing around to bring my soul to heaven, that it may worship before the face of God. That's like all-encompassing. I mean, you, they don't slumber. They're our guardians. You know, we ask them to pray for us. I mean, so they have lots of roles. And that's a question. What are all those roles? Yeah, sometimes it's, it's good to look, too, from the other side. Um, from more the negative side of things because um, while to start and say what are all the things we can say affirmatively it might be that in our time which is short um, we, we look at those things that we ought not to fall into thinking about them. So the first question would be um, are angels natural or supernatural? So I would ask you off, off the cuff what would you say about angels natural or supernatural? Well off the cuff I would say they're supernatural. Okay but knowing, as you do, as a, a, a person right. who has read and studied and heard these things, um, no, that's the first distinction we make, that no, they are part of the natural order. Mm -hmm. um, we start out our creed, um, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. So the acknowledgement right up front um, is that there's a whole segment of, of creation, um, some of which we don't even know about right now, but which includes the invisible, which includes the holy angels. Um, so we know that they are unseen. Um, we've already said that they are, are spirits, um, but they are still on this side of createdness. So the distinction between um, supernatural or natural is always, always to look at God who is uncreated and recognize that everything else is created. Okay, so, so when we look at angels and their role, what, are, what do people ask you most? You, you speak about angels a lot and to secular people. What do they ask you most about angels? Well, probably the first thing that, that comes to their minds or the first place that angels very often come up is when, when someone has lost somebody, mm -hmm. especially children. Um, you know, is my child, or, or we'll hear people speak um, in, in a very beautiful kind of way about their child who, who died and who is now an angel watching over them in heaven. Well, one of the things that we want to make sure we don't do um, is, is confuse angelic nature with human nature. Um, angels do not become people. People do not become angels. Um, so that's significant for us to remember because all of the things we're going to talk about only make sense if our relationship to the angels sheds some light on who we are and who we are in the whole context of who God is. So um, one of the dangers of this present day and age is that, especially in the, let's say, the new age sense, um, is that we, we sometimes look at angels almost as though they're God. And, and that's interesting because um, we religious people um, have been killing each other about lots of things, you know, for thousands of years. One of the things that we seem to agree on to a, a high degree is angels. Pretty much all of the major, in fact, all the major religions have angels. All of the major religions have the angels doing basically the same functions. They're messengers, they're protectors, they're doing all those kinds of things. They're warriors. Um, even when we look into what we would call the, the dark side of American culture over there in Hollywood, um, movies are very good at, at, at accurately portraying Angels. You're right. You're right. I mean, and, and it's there, but, you know, we people say, oh, I've seen an angel. I've been visited by an angel. You know, how do you know when sort of you're, whether it's your guardian angel or whomever, how do you know that you've been visited by an angel, even one of the ones who are in this studio right now? Okay. Well, one of the things we would, would go back to is that, that simple phrase that pretty much um, anybody who struggles with um, knowing God has to deal with is that um, if we believe in God, there are no accidents. Um, okay, so if I am a believer, it means that everything has purpose to it, everything has direction to it. Um, right there, um, many of the things that I would call uh, yeah, coincidence. Mm -hmm. um, like, like, oh, I used to a long time ago ride a motorcycle, mm -hmm. and I'd be out at two in the morning or something like that riding down the road. Um, four-lane highway in, in Southern California, change lanes for no good reason at all. 30 seconds down the road, notice that there's a refrigerator or an or a easy chair laying right there in the highway that I would have run into. 
Um, boy, I was lucky, wasn't I? That's exactly right. I was just thinking most of us would end up saying, wow, that was lucky. Right. Good ideas. Um, or how many times have we called somebody who, you know, when we make that phone call who we right. haven't spoken to for eight months, uh, they say, you know, I was just thinking of you. Thank you for calling. I really needed to hear from you right now. Or, or when we find ourselves um, sometimes in a state of sadness or depression, you know, um, and then we, we hear what we think is our inner self speaking, mm -hmm. saying something like, okay, it's time to get up and get on with it now. Stop being such a baby. <laughs> um, so all of these things could be simply the, the more normal explanation, right? Um, or it could be our angels intervening. And we would say that, you know, certainly our guardian angels, it's going to be part of their job as, as um, ever present with us. Well, we have just a moment or two, but I want you to see if you can sum up what's the most important thing for us to know about angels. Uh, Billy Graham um, once said that he, he knows that there are angels, but he doesn't have any clue why. Um, because God could certainly, had he chosen to do so, although this is kind of speaking foolishly, um, since this is the way it is, God could do anything any way he wants. For some reason, um, the way that God has chosen to, to order creation um, is with these angelic powers that, that range in their activities all the way from um, worshiping at the very throne of God right down to taking care of us when we're riding down the highway trying to fiddle with the radio, smoke our cigarettes, drink our coffee... Um, and do all those other kinds of things safely. Okay, well, we're going to be back to talk a little bit more about angels uh, a little bit later in the program. But John Rigetti is going to be talking with you in just a few moments. He's going to talk to an iconographer, really discussing how, I, how angels are depicted in the Orthodox Church. Stay with us. Why do the Orthodox use three fingers to make the sign of the cross? The three fingers symbolize the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The two fingers folded down signify the divine and human natures of Christ. Until some time after 1204, it was the other way round. Two fingers straight out, three held down, as is still practiced by Russian old ritualists. I'm talking with Mark Canan, local iconographer, about angels, or I should say the icon depiction of angels. Mark, welcome. Nice to have you. Thank you, John. When we, as an iconographer, depict angels, um, we have popular images of angels, but what do you do as iconographer to kind of capture an angel, I guess, in the Orthodox style? Uh, in the Orthodox style, very different from uh, the Renaissance style that most people are accustomed to seeing, things that would be on the Sistine Chapel type of thing. Um, depicted in, a, in the traditional Byzantine style uh, where we portray uh, personages as spiritual beings and not physical beings on earth. And when we think about popular angels, and you know, right away what comes to mind are those fat little cherubs with right. little wings. How does the orthodox depiction or the orthodox understanding of angels differ when you're painting an icon? Uh, in, in painting or writing an icon, uh, um, they are not the fat little beings that we're used to seeing. Um, they are more of, of, of messengers of God, uh, defenders of, of, of God's will, um, and shown in a, in a spiritual realm uh, more than, more than in, a, in a physical realm, like those, those cherubs are. We have uh, seraphim and cherubim that are shown as many-eyed and many-winged uh, in a circular fashion as, des as described in the uh, uh, Testaments. And when you capture them, Mark, as heavenly or spiritual beings? Are there particular ways in which you draw them or paint them? Are there things you pay attention to in terms of facial features, for instance? Um, certainly in, in traditional uh, iconography style, they're, they're painted just like any other icon uh, with elongated noses and elongated fingers and small mouths and uh, uh, sort of enlarged eyes and that type of thing. Why is that? Uh, different reasons for that. The, um, uh, uh, for example, a large forehead would, would, would portray wisdom. Um, the, a, a larger foot would portray uh, a saint traveling the land to, to preach the gospel, uh, that type of thing. So as iconographer, you really don't kind of have the freedom to create it from scratch. You're working with characteristics in mind. That's, that's absolutely right. Uh, as an iconographer, we don't create anything new uh, per se, unless of course a new saint comes along. Um, but uh, we paint from uh, older icons so that we keep the, uh, the, the art ancient. 
Well, let's take a look at some icons. I think one of the most common we were talking offset are Gabriel and Michael. These are archangels. There archangels. are many ranks of angels, and they are archangels. And we have a, a set that you've written, as yes. we say, in the Orthodox Church. Why don't you compare and contrast Michael and Gabriel? How would I know who is who? Um, typically, they will, they will have uh, contrasting colors, blue and red, uh, usually. Uh, one would have blue on the, uh, the, the tunic and, and red on the mantle uh, and, and, and reversed on the other side. Uh, in these particular instances, obviously, one's a full figure and one is not. Um, the, uh, when seen together as a set, one will hold IC and one will hold XC, which is, of course, the Greek abbreviation for Jesus Christ. Um, but typically, reading the name would really give it, would give it away for give you. Give the clue. Yeah. And we can see here when you talked about some of the characteristics of facial features right. and iconography that you carry the same thing for human beings and angels. There's really right. no and they're shown expressionless as well. Okay. Uh, there are lots of applications of angels in iconography. Yes, there are. Um, one that you've brought today to share with us uh, is this one. This is actually an icon of, the, as we call her, the Theotokos, or the Mother of God, right. holding the Christ child. But we've got angels in here. Why don't you tell us about the application of angels in other icons? Sure. The, the, uh, the um, legend here is that, that Christ uh, had angels appear to him uh, holding the instruments of his death. So you can see the, the cross and the crown of thorns and the nails uh, and the spear and the sponge. And uh, Christ as a child was, was, was frightened by that vision. And uh, he ran to his mother. And in his haste, you can see his, his slipper uh, fell off. That's okay. the story behind this particular icon. I see. Now, other applications of angels. Here's another icon that you've written. Um, maybe you can describe this to us and, and what this is. Uh, in the Gospels, unless I'm mistaken, this is never uh, uh, referred to specifically as Gabriel, but we, we, we um, take it to be Gabriel because he was the messenger of God for the most part. Um, Gabriel appears to the myrrh-bearing women at the tomb uh, to tell them that Christ is uh, gone from the tomb. Uh, and you see he's shown all in, in, in white and gray, which is a little bit different from, from the red and blue that they're typically seen with. And why is that? Um, I believe it's because it's, it's after the, the resurrection of Christ. Okay. And we have just a, a few moments left, but we also wanted to talk a little bit about the application of angels as others within the context. And tell us very briefly about this. Briefly, this is an icon by uh, St. Andrei Rublev. Um, and he depicts the hospitality of Abraham, uh, the Holy Trinity here, as three angels who are equal uh, in a triangular fashion, uh, all sitting around uh, the table in, in, in a very equal pose. It's, it gives us a good understanding of what the Trinity is. Okay, so we see lots of applications for angels in the iconography Absolutely. of the Orthodox Church. Absolutely. Thanks for being with us. It's really my enjoyed pleasure, it. John. Thank you. And stay with us. We're going to go back to Quaylin Nassar and Father John Nosel to talk more about fallen angels and angels in general. Why do the bridal couple at an Orthodox wedding go around the table in the center of the church three times? This procession symbolizes going through life together in permanent mutual commitment and as witnesses to the saving message of Christ. The same hymns are sung as when candidates for ordination are conducted three times around the altar. I'm Quaylen Nassar, and we've been talking about angels today. And right now, Father John, we want to talk about the dark side of angels. Is there one? Absolutely. Um, when we look at, as I said earlier um, in, in the first segment, um, we always have to hold these things in, in full and complete perspective of the whole picture. So we know that um, if we feel as though there's a, a, a war being waged between good and evil, it's not between God and the devil. And that's one of the first mistakes we make when we, we kind of raise you know, the devil up to a, a level of um, deity almost, but he's not. So the war that's being waged right now cosmically all over the place, even though we can't see it, right. um, is between the archangel Michael um, and the angels of heaven and Lucifer. So that's where the struggle is going on. It's also interesting to, to say, so see how... So it's going on at a different level, obviously. Well, you know, one of the things that's said about um, when we look at when... Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden, uh, that they were given um, garments of, of uh, skin to cover them. And part of what's said about that is that it's so that we don't see what's going on because we wouldn't be able to bear it. 
Hmm. So it's good for us to remember that that's going on right now, you know, all around us. Um, and we ought to, in a certain sense, thank God we can't see it <laughs> because we wouldn't be up to it. Um, okay, so one, one of the things, too, about the, the fallen angels, though, and it, it's because, again, if we don't reflect on how it, it lets us know something about ourselves, then we're missing some of the point. Um, when we look at angelic nature um, as bodiless, and we tie that into the saying um, in, in our tradition that says um, the goal of the Christian life is to kill the passions. So for the angels, they have no passions because appetites, passions, um, come from what? Come from having bodies and having bodily needs. So we have appetites that we satisfy by what we eat, right. and then we eat too much. We, have, we drink, and then we drink too much. Um, our brains have passions for, for a higher consciousness, which we in our fallen state satisfy with, with drugs and things like that. Um, in our bodies, we also know that there's the sex drive that, that we use to procreate, which is good, but, but again, taken to all kinds of, of, of uh, extremes. Um, it's the cause of our fall. When we look at Lucifer, whose name is, you know, uh, the light bearer, then when we consider what happens in, the, in his fall, um, it's, a, it's a horribly um, tragic and, and unbelievable thing. And I'm going to read a little bit about that. Before you read that, let me just ask you a question. You're, you're, you're there and you're talking about all of these other kinds of drives that we have and things that can be fallen. Is that an influence of a fallen angel that that's happening? Or is that just within us? That's our sin. Okay. That's when we turn, when we fall prey to the temptation that, that, that Lucifer, but who, the devil, is already But that's not necessarily being influenced by a fallen angel in that sense. Well, except in this, well, sort of is. temptation in yeah. the garden. Right. right. But, but this is, and listen to the very end of what's going on here. Because, you know, sometimes we, we ponder and we look and say, well, you know, boy, it's, it's hard to live as, as good Christians. It's hard to be moral. It's hard to be. But what we pray for is always that God know, knows why we do what we do. Um, we always pray that somehow it's um, because we don't know what we're doing or because we're weak or because we're in the flesh or because of some other kind of reason. But when we listen to what we say about Lucifer, it, it gets very spine-chilling. Hmm. This is again quoting from uh, Mother Alexandra's book. Caught by the undeniable beauty, perfection, goodness of his own angelic nature, fully comprehended, Lucifer loved it. That was as it should be. But his love refused to budge a step beyond this refused to look beyond the angelic perfection to its divine source. He insisted upon resting in that beauty to find their fullness of happiness to be sufficient unto himself. As is the way of pride, Lucifer isolated himself even from God. Lucifer's sin consisted in loving himself, as pride insists, to the exclusion of all else, and this with no excuse, without ignorance, without error, without passion, Without previous disorder in his angelic will, his was a sin of pure malice. That is spine chilling. I mean, you're, you know, we think of Lucifer, we think of the devil, and we know that there's all of these negative things, but when you hear it's pure malice, I mean, that, that yeah, is. Yeah, this is not just, you know, right. the little yeah. devil sitting on your shoulder whispering in your ear. No, this is a, 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 an angelic, powerful, marvelous creature. Right. that wants to devour us. Well, let's take it to a more positive note now and talk about our guardian angel. Okay, so not wanting to have anybody have any nightmares, <laughs> you know, after, after hearing some of the things that we've said so far. Um, you know, all we can do with, with uh, our existence is to be um, joyful thanksgivers. And if we should do anything, and if we're called to do anything in our, our church's tradition, it's to be awake. And what are we supposed to be awake to? We're supposed to be awake to reality as it is. So that means that everywhere we go, our goal is to be able to carry in the Holy Spirit um, a, a, an acknowledgement and, and a, uh, a, a thankful um, attitude toward all around us, which includes this, these marvelous beings that are given to us. I mean, again, ranging all the way from the throne of the God right down to with me right now, who's going to drive home with me and as I go home in my car. So when are they given to us? When is that guardian angel when we're given born. to us? When we're born. And stays with us forever. That's what we believe. Okay. That, you and, know. and maybe most importantly, if you remember that first prayer, when we die. Right. And when we as, die. As a guide. Because be it's there. going to be territory that we're not all that familiar with, many of us. So we only have a few moments left, but what should our relationship be with our guardian angel? Love. God's love. 
No, that was that was that was. It's always the answer. Yeah, if you were to look at at the at our not only our relationship you but how angels. You were hoping for something longer, weren't you? <laughs> I was, but that's okay. I think that that was poignant enough. But if we were looking for, you know, we're just talking about our entire relationship or how they fit into our lives. What would you say about angels? Okay, um, when we when we think of what what it means for things to be providential, it means that we recognize. That, that God before all time, before creation even began, has already seen everything that will happen to us and how that's being orchestrated and how that's being um, laid out for us and how we're given the choices that we in our free will do make. Um, a large part of that is, is what the, our angels do with us. And so the key thing to too is that you know those angels are around us I think you know hopefully hopefully as they are here with us in our studio they're going to enjoy or feel that we've done a good job in, in talking and well, sharing once about again, that. Well once again please if, if we've misrepresented too badly please forgive us. Or we get bonked in the head. No. Actually thank you very much for explaining angels in such a wonderfully uh, understandable way for all of us who have our guardian angels right beside us on our shoulder. Thanks for being with You're us. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Angels all around us. What a comforting thought. Kui Lin, what should we take away from our discussion well, today? Well, it is a comforting thought, and I think the first thing that we should remember is, is that you know angels are created and they have free will. And indeed, angels are everywhere, which I think is is... You know, you're right, very comforting. Sort of reminds me of the City of Angels movie. And that also that we've been given a guardian angel and that it's our job to cooperate and to work with that guardian angel. Uh -huh. Wonderful thoughts, wonderful ideas. It is. We hope you'll continue to stay with us and we hope you'll listen to Orthodoxy now, Wednesday mornings at 9.30 a.m. on WEDO, 8.10 on your dial a.m. And watch us here at Orthodoxy now Christian Associates Channel 95 in the City of Pittsburgh, or Comcast On Demand. If you have topics you'd like us to cover or questions you'd like to ask us, you can write to us at the address on your screen or email us at www.orthodoxynowtv.org. Thanks for being with us.